Hello, hello, hello. Hello, everybody. I am fine. And I am currently on the wrong layer, so let's fix that real quick. There we go. Hello. Hello, it's me. How is everybody doing? I am doing quite well. My job still hasn't started up in earnest, and so that means I have more time to do content, which is great. How are you? How are you? How are you all? All right. All right. All right. Content. Making content. We're good. OBS is set up. Uh, <laughs> just got the second monitor, so it's been awesome. But now I need to actually make sure that I'm capable of functioning correctly here. So uh, I'm assuming you all are here because you are interested in RNA. Uh, so I'm very excited to be able to talk to you about what that is going to be be like. Uh, can I explain neurons, please? So, in the future, I will actually probably do whole streams and whole videos about neurons, but for today, we do have, uh, let's say, an agenda, fixed agenda. Although, if you have some particular questions about neurons, I would be very happy to, quick, to take quick diversions. Um, but with that being said, Let's get into it. So let's talk a little bit about the chemistry of life, and let's do so by putting on a little bit of background music. So let me know if, if the music is too loud, all right? So we're set up, we're good. Let me know if the audio is too loud or too quiet. Um, but without further ado, let's talk about the chemistry of life and kind of what my idea is for this kind of stream, right? So something that I talked about in previous streams is the fact that when you take biology, uh, when your education stops formally, you barely scratch the surface of what makes biology interesting, at least in my opinion, right? And so what I want to do with my streams is to actually bring you interesting stories from biology that required going a little deeper than you otherwise would have in class. So that's why I have this set up. I think that RNA, in the grand scheme of things, gets a little bit of the short end of the stick when you first learn about biology. It's kind of seen as this like mediator between DNA and protein. And while that's true, there's a lot more going on that makes RNA its own uh, interesting entity. So we'll get into that. But first, let's talk a little bit about announcements. So for those of you who primarily know me as the guy that makes the Plague Inc. shorts, I have good news for you, is that I have finished writing the rest of the Plague Inc. series, which is very exciting because I kind of want to do like a stream where I go through all of the Plague Inc. entities in a format where I'm not constrained by the minute format of YouTube Shorts, right? So it's really been a challenge to talk at length about what I find interesting about Plague Inc. in one minute and to be able to finally finish this short series and then talk freely about each one of these plagues uh, is really exciting to me. So I hope you'll tune in to watch those. I just released one this morning about Plague Inc.'s nanovirus, if you haven't seen that already. The next thing on my agenda is the fact that I have a collab in the works, which is very exciting. I'm not going to reveal who I will be collaborating with quite yet, but um, if you are not new to my channel, I don't think it'll really come as a surprise to you, so keep that in mind. In terms of my next long-term project, my next long-term project is actually going to be working on my gonorrhea video. So uh, I had kind of teased in the comment section of some of the stuff that I've done that I'm interested in releasing a video about STDs, sexually transmitted diseases. 
but I originally was not going to pick gonorrhea. And the reason why I settled on gonorrhea is because gonorrhea has very interesting and specific interactions with neutrophils. So cells like me, right? And so I figured that's a little more pressing, urgent, interesting to me. I only write videos that I'm currently passionate about. If an idea doesn't exactly like hit me in the right way, I'll put it on the back burner for later. That's why the Plague Inc. videos have taken a little bit of time to release. I just didn't have any good ideas for nanovirus, but given enough time, I think I came up with something that I actually enjoy. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to say is uh, if you want to get more content from me, like short form content like memes, go follow me on X, Twitter, whatever you want to call it, at Neutral Phil. So that's what I have to say in terms of my own announcements. So next, I want to talk a little bit about my agenda for this stream. So as I said, I want to revisit the biology that you learned in high school and dive a little deeper into what makes those chapters interesting. Then I'll give a little bit of a background on the exact paper that we will be reading. Um, although this time, instead of just reading the paper on screen, I've actually converted the paper into a PowerPoint presentation so that you don't have to slog through me, you know, scrolling through a PDF the entire time. It'll be more visually interesting, I think. Then we'll read a paper on how RNA kills the rubella virus or does it, question mark, and how rubella kills RNA. So RNA, as I've been teasing, is a very multifaceted, multifunctional type of molecule, which makes it very exciting to talk about in its different contexts. But uh, first, as I tab over to this next slide, I kind of just want to hear about your current understanding or your current level of comfort with talking about biological molecules. So for those of you who are in stream today, if you could be so kind as to tell me to what degree you are familiar with biology, it'll really allow me to calibrate my own vocabulary um, so that I am conscious of what you may or may not know. I would love to hear from you. Although I might, I might choose to do that as a poll. I know what are living. That's fair. That's fair. Good to hear. But yeah. Is anybody like post-education, post-final degree that you got? Uh, you did microbiome in undergrad. Okay. So you'll, you'll be quite familiar with a lot that I have to say. Um, yeah. And maybe you'll be able to offer some insight because I actually did not specialize in microbiome. This is just like a side passion of mine. Let's see. Hi, Joshua. I got an A in biology GSCE, but I haven't touched it since. I'm guessing that's the equivalent of high school, but I don't really know what GSCE is. I'm literally a kid. Cool, cool. Grad school biology education here to support the content. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and if I get anything wrong, please feel free to chime in or if you have your own unique insights as to what uh, we will be doing. Cool. Cool. All right. So quite the spread of different comfort levels with biology, which is very exciting because it means that some of us older folk can pass off some things that we find quite interesting to some of you younger folk, which is very, very fun. Okay, so on screen we have the suite of biological molecules um, that we primarily care about, the ones that are quote unquote the most important for life. And so if you've ever taken a biology class, these are not tremendously difficult to identify, but let's go through them anyway. So on the left here, we have the iconic DNA represented by a double helical ladder of uh, deoxyribose sugar bases that have complementary binding that allow you to form this zipper shape. We know that DNA is the hereditary genetic material that is essential for the blueprint of life. This is the information that your body uses to uh, construct itself. 
and all of evolution is based around making sure that this molecule gets to survive another generation. Pretty interesting. Pretty interesting way to think about DNA. Uh, something that I heard in grad school, and I, I really wish, I've been searching for this quote, so if some of you bioheads in chat know where this quote is from, it's something like, uh, your entire body is constructed to be like a spaceship for your gonads. And what that basically means is that, you know, your entire flesh and blood, uh, your entire being, if you want to think of it in a biologically determinist way, is here to ensure that your DNA can continue to exist. And, you know, don't take anything weird from that in terms of like, sociology or psychology or anything like that. This is purely a biological observation. So pretty interesting molecule and it deservedly gets a lot of press and a lot of time in classrooms to talk about. The star of today, however, is the molecule right next to it, this RNA. RNA is different than DNA. Instead of a deoxyribose, it is just a ribose sugar. So the chemistry in these bases is very, very slightly different, right? And this one change at this sugar allows RNA to do some incredible things. So DNA is always double-stranded for the most part. RNA, however, can be single-stranded, can be double-stranded, can fold up into itself in all sorts of different fun shapes. And we're going to talk a little bit about what those shapes do. Very exciting. Uh, that is the greatest quote I have ever read. I know, I, I really wish I knew who said it because it's, it's so funny. Uh, okay, so... RNA is used for a whole lot. Uh, what we typically know RNA to do in the context of what you would have learned in high school is to be the intermediate between DNA and proteins. So DNA is the template, the information. RNA is kind of like the, the, the middle ground between DNA and protein in the sense that you need to uh, read the DNA to make an RNA transcript and then that RNA is then read to make a protein. And so proteins are like the other half of your biological education. These are the chemical workhorses of the cell. So these are the molecules that are actually doing things. Uh, using cellular energy to catalyze enzymatic reactions. They make up a lot of the structural components of your cells. Um, you could spend an endless number of hours just talking about proteins and enzymes, and there are so, so many of them. Again, it makes sense that a lot of your education revolves around looking at proteins and how they function. And over here on the right, we have lipids, which are basically fats. So these are uh, molecules that are essential for life in the sense that lipids allow you to separate biological compartments. So on the right here, we have a micelle, so just a, a soap bubble, essentially. And so this is really the beginning of life. Uh, quote unquote, we don't know if this formed before DNA or RNA, but without lipids, we would have no separation between different organisms and their environments. So this allows you not only to separate outside from in, but also to concentrate important molecules for life. So all of these broad classes of molecules are really, really important for continuance of life. And so the central dogma is a term used to describe the flow of information, and I have in here generally. There's some debate as to whether or not there can be information flow going in the other direction, but for the most part when we talk about the central dogma, it's DNA to RNA to protein. DNA is very important, it's your her hereditary genetic information, protein does all the work, and RNA is often talked about as just being kind of in the middle, which is underselling how cool they are. So lipids are the walls that divide living things from everything else. Correct. Correct. Your cell membrane is made out of phospholipids. Yep. Okay. So here is a broke take. Uh, RNA is the intermediate between DNA and protein. It's certainly true. mRNA, messenger RNA, is in the middle of this information flow. But the woke take is that RNA needs to be able to do the job of DNA and protein to be in the middle, which makes this molecule, in some regards, 
more amazing than its flanking molecules. So what do I mean by that? What job does RNA, or what jobs can RNA do that make it so that it is so multifaceted and interesting? Okay. Uh, can you combine two RNAs to make DNA? So RNA and DNA, they actually are chemically different. So while RNA can be double-stranded, it won't be DNA because it's just made of different stuff. So RNA is information like DNA that can also do stuff. So they're multifaceted, whereas DNA is basically there just to be the blueprint RNA contains the same or similar information and is then able to act upon that information. And there are two of these special RNA types that get talked about, perhaps too briefly in general biology education, and that those are the transfer RNA or tRNA and ribosomal RNA. So once transfer RNAs are built, you only need RNA to build protein which means RNA is catalytic. And so what do I mean by catalytic? RNA, unlike DNA, can actually do chemical work or, or be a vehicle by which chemical reactions can occur. So take that in for a second, right? DNA is just there to be the blueprint, but RNA has the information of the blueprint and can do chemistry. So in some ways, it's more amazing than either DNA or protein. And I think that's really, 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 really cool. To explain a little further as to why I think this is cool, uh, RNA can take on many different forms and functions. So just on this last slide, we have three of them. Messenger RNA, which is the intermediate between DNA and protein. Transfer RNA, which carries amino acids. And ribosomal RNA, which is an RNA that makes up its own organelle that allows you to stitch together the amino acids to make protein. So proteins, as we know them in our current understanding of biology, could not be built without RNA. Uh, Dima, so we can use RNA instead of protein. So RNA has not been shown to do as much as protein. So protein there are so many different types of proteins and so many different types of enzymes that do all sorts of different things. RNA, as far as we know right now, isn't capable of that many different chemical reactions. But the fact is, is that they can do chemical reactions. And that by itself is pretty cool because, okay, because not only can RNA take on many different forms and functions, we can think about RNA as maybe being the missing link between an abiotic world and the world full of life as we know it today. And what do I mean by that? Before I get into RNA world stuff, let's just think about the fact that some forms of quote unquote life are RNA based, like RNA viruses and viroids. So. I put life in quotes because people can disagree as to whether or not viruses should count as life, but we do know that RNA-based self-replicating things do exist, so that itself is pretty cool. And that this kind of hints that maybe, oh, we're well, not this particular fact, but the fact that RNA can do both the job of DNA and protein kind of suggests that it might have something or it might be essential to the origin of life, which is, I think, very interesting to think about. Synthetic biologists love this molecule because it is like DNA in the sense that it is hereditary, or not hereditary, but it contains genetic information. But it can also do some chemistry, so you can make tools that are sensitive to genetic uh, changes that can then act upon those changes. So synthetic biologists love this molecule and its potential to be a kind of like a switch molecule. Uh, Joshua, is viroid the singular of viruses or am I missing something? I believe viroid is its own special class of viruses that are mostly infective to plants. So I don't know actually too much about them, uh, but I believe there's special type of virus that infects, that infects plants. Good question. Oh, by the way, I'm very happy to answer questions as I go along. You don't have to wait for me to get to the end of a rant because I can talk forever. 
Yeah, so RNA. This hypothesis that RNA was the first spark, you could say, that enabled life to form is called the RNA world hypothesis, which uh, I suggest you look into if this kind of stuff sounds cool to you. Uh, I've never heard of the term viroid either. Yeah, uh, something that I really think is undersold in canonical biological education is the study of plants. I hated learning about plants when I was in high school because, you know, I wanted to be a medical doctor, so why would I ever care about the biology of plants? But it turns out that's its whole, like, other thing that I'd love to get into one day. Alright. So, uh, do we have any questions? Have I convinced you that RNA is pog and worth... worth valuing as much as D? Oh, that's not even to say, like... You know, we just had a pandemic. And part of the reason why we haven't been, like, eliminated as a species is some of these newfangled RNA... vaccines, right? So it turns out when you make your own cells make vaccine, that it works perhaps better than traditional vaccines, which I think is cool. The thing with viroids is that they are small pieces of circular RNA without the protein found in other viruses. Strange and weird creatures. Yeah, it really... If viruses already pushed the definition of life, the fact that these are just floating RNAs uh, that can self-replicate pushes the definition of life even harder. Very neat, very neat. Is there something between RNA and protein? Uh, not really. Once you have the tRNAs built, and you have the ribosomes, that's all you need to make protein. Pretty neat, pretty neat. Oh, uh, I guess you need, like, energy and stuff, too. Um, but there's no major intermediate between RNA and protein. Okay. So, in canonical biological education, you do learn about those three different types of RNA, mRNA, tRNA, and rRNA, but there are like a zillion other types of RNA, all with very special different interactions. And the thing that I want to talk about today is something called siRNA, or small interfering RNAs. So, what you need to know about siRNA is that these are RNAs that are generated uh, I'll talk a little bit more about how these are generated later, but they are generated basically to destroy other mRNAs. So siRNAs, these small interfering RNAs, finds and binds its complementary RNA and then destroys it. And for those of you who don't know, uh, CRISPR works very similarly. So most people know CRISPR as this magic tool that biologists can use to manipulate DNA, that's definitely true, but originally, CRISPR evolved in bacteria to fight viruses. And the way that they fought viruses is by sort of taking viral DNA, viral DNA RNA, incorporating, incorporating it into its own genome, and then making these mRNAs that look like viral mRNAs, so that when they find and bind that viral mRNA, enzymes can then destroy that mRNA. So if you destroy the mRNA, you destroy any proteins that that sequence would have made. I think proteins are more pog than RNA. Can RNA walk? I don't think so. Uh, maybe not yet, but RNAs are capable of doing some really insane things. Uh, they can switch and move in funny ways. Maybe one day someone will engineer a walking RNA. You never know. Let's see. Sir RNA, the cultured molecule, <laughs> exactly. You have a video about this. Correct. Thank you so much, Joshua, for the plug. I made a whole video about CRISPR and the fact that CRISPR is the virus's immune system, uh, the bacteria's immune system to fight viruses. Very fun. Okay. So, uh, the thing that I need you to take away from this slide is basically that this class of RNA is generated, it finds and binds its uh, 
complement and then enzymes destroy it. So this is a way to uh, control how much mRNA is out there. So this is a very interesting kind of side discussion, but I got a comment on a video about uh, on my Mew short about the fact that a lot of the genome, a lot of your DNA does not actually code for protein. And for a while, people thought that maybe that non-coding DNA was useless. They called it junk DNA. But we know now that it's not really junk DNA if it doesn't make protein because a lot of DNA is just there to regulate how, where, and why a protein is being made. A lot of the construction of your genetic code goes into regulating what is made and what isn't and where it's being made. So this system where you can make RNAs that destroy other RNAs is another level of genetic control. So if your body needs to pump the brakes on making a certain protein, it can increase the amount of RNA that it makes and then those siRNAs would be able to destroy those messenger RNAs ergo or therefore preventing the protein from being made. And some organisms have adopted this techno this technology, this technique to destroy viruses. So if they detect viral DNA, they might be able to make something or take advantage of the viral RNA and then destroy it. So that's cool, right? So we're more used to thinking about the immune system in terms of T cells and neutrophils and, you know, that's what you would learn in Bio 101, but even within cells, even when we're not talking about cells of the immune system, your cells still come equipped with their own immune system. And part of that could be this siRNA system, this RNA interference uh, strategy. Although up until recently, it, re it remained kind of controversial whether or not eukaryotes, so higher organisms like, you know, humans, it was kind of unknown whether or not eukaryotes were capable of doing that or whether or not this strategy is mostly for things like bacteria and plants. That's why I got a little lost in the sauce and haven't read chat in a little bit. All right. Uh, Dima, does tRNA need proteins to form or is it self-assembling? So that's a great question. So tRNA actually does need protein. So it needs uh, these, this class of enzyme called transferases. So that's also pretty interesting, right? So you can't really decouple RNA from protein, protein from DNA. It's kind of probably why it's so hard to figure out what happened to spark life, right? DNA needs protein to replicate. RNA needs to be read from DNA. Protein needs RNA to be built, but RNA also needs protein to make protein. It's a convoluted mess, but it's an interesting story. Uh, let's see. Isn't there a class of RNA used to tag genes and switch them off too? Uh, to tag genes. So uh, you might be referring to transcription factors. Please tell me there's a missile molecule. Not as far as I know, but there are some things called ejectosomes, which I learned about in the tuberculosis video. Uh, the ability to eject vesicles from cells. Very fun. Yeah, we are biological machines. It's pretty cool when you think about it. Uh, all right. We got microcomputers. We need a weapon of destruction in micro scale. That's basically what an antibiotic is, right? So uh, I don't quite remember how penicillin works, but I believe penicillin is a molecule that pokes holes in bacterial cell membranes. So someone, a biologist in chat, could maybe help me out with that. Um, but if you're looking for something like a missile on a nano or micro scale, it's probably antibiotics. All right. Okay, so 
SIRNA allows for another layer of genetic control and might be useful to stop viruses from doing their thing because if viruses can't build themselves and they don't get built, then they die, right? So SIRNAs are pretty cool. Penicillin interrupts peptidoglycan synthesis, if I remember correctly. Ah, uh, um, so I'm trying to remember my immunology. I think maybe there are definitely antibiotics that poke holes in membranes. I just don't remember what they're called. A lot of antibiotics are in some way or another designed to destroy the bacterial cell membrane. Um, I believe that there is an immune attack complex that also pokes holes in, in bacteria, but that I'm not entirely sure of too. But uh, maybe we'll do a stream one day where we talk about antibiotics and how they uh, destroy bacteria. I think that'd be really fun. Okay. So let's talk. Yeah, it's one of the innate ones. I can't remember. I mean, I just remember attack complex because yeah, I think... Um, it might have been more juice who just said in chat that biology has the most badass names. We really do. Like, once you once you hear attack, immune attack complex, it, you can't forget it. Can't forget it. Okay. So let's talk about how this process happens. Okay. All right. So, in the event that a virus infects a host. If this host is an RNA virus, uh, or the virus, if the virus, ugh, sorry, if the virus is an RNA virus, if it's double stranded, uh, that double stranded RNA might float around in the host. The host has this, uh, or creates this protein uh, enzyme called Dicer. And so what Dicer does is that it takes short pieces of double stranded RNA and dices them in half. And so once Dicer does its job, you get an siRNA. So this thing here, single-stranded, small interfering RNA. This RNA binds something called the risk complex. Then this risk complex sort of guides the small interfering RNA to its complementary RNA. And then this risk complex destroys the mRNA. So that's how this works, right? And, and please ask questions if this isn't clear because this is going to be important for the rest of the stream. Uh, yeah, so Dicer binds double-stranded RNA, converts it to small interfering RNA. The risk complex uses that small interfering RNA brings it to the viral RNA and the risk complex will cleave this, destroy this transcript, prevent the virus from making copies of its own proteins. Biology has risk too, huh? What is risk in your context? I'd be curious to know. Right. Oh, it's a cop side thing. Interesting. Yeah, if you couldn't tell, in biology there are a ton of acronyms. A ton, a ton of acronyms. It's actually, I think, uh, a heavy barrier for students to get through. You know, when you pull up a paper and you just read acronyms, it can be kind of overwhelming. <laughs> Risk is a board game. True, true. You're not wrong. You're not wrong. Um, that reminds me that there are so many acronyms in biology that some of them end up overlapping and it gets so confusing. Like, MAP? is a very common acronym, MAP. It can be mitogen associated protein and like two different other things, something like that. Uh, it, it can be quite confusing. Unfortunately, you can see there are so many things to talk about that it's impossible to get around making acronyms in general. The papers would be so much longer if you had to spell everything out every single time. Like, can you imagine, instead of saying DNA, just saying deoxyribonucleic acid every time? It's sort of a necessary evil to have all these acronyms. But okay, let's finally get into the paper. We know why RNA is POG, we know that RNA can be used to fight viruses. It's a little controversial whether or not this happens in human cells, but we're going to look at a paper uh, where that might be that might that that might be made a little more clear. 
there are only 17,576 three-letter combinations. That's true. There are a ton of biological molecules, though. Have you ever run across an acronym nested inside each other yet? Uh, that's a good question. None come to mind right now, but I do know that in some cell signaling cascades that you have MAP, then you have MAP-K, which is MAP kinase. Uh, so it's a an enzyme that interacts with MAP, but you also have MAP kinase kinase, MAP-KK. And then you also have MAP kinase kinase kinase, which is the enzyme that interacts with the enzyme that interacts with the enzyme that interacts with MAP. So that's kind of like nested acronyms, kind of nuts. Uh, hello, ya boy. Okay, so let's talk about this paper, right? The capsid protein of rubella virus antagonizes RNA interference in mammalian cells, and this is by Shu et al. This came out, I believe, in 2021. It's an open access paper, which means you can all read it for free. A link in the description. And let's go through this paper together. So, what makes my stream unique? is that I will actually take you through the paper. I'm not going to baby it for you. We're actually going to look at the paper and look at the data, and I will guide you through understanding it, but it's up to you to actually get it, right? So if you want to practice thinking like a scientist, this is the stream to do it, all right? I think one of the worst habits biologists have is inventing a name, inventing an acronym, and then changing the name and keeping the acronym true true very complicated okay so here is our motivating question we know that rna interference which is the system by which siRNA destroys its complementary rna can fight off a viral infection whether or not that happens in eukaryotes eh, but we know that this can happen can viruses fight siRNA? So we know that evolution is this constant arms race, right? It's this constant arms race for survival. Um, and the way that organisms have adapted to survival is awesome. And so it seems that if there is a host sabotaging system to destroy the virus, that the virus might also have a way to sabotage the host. And so this is what we are concerned with. Previous research has shown that the capsid, or the capsule, or the coat, the outside of a virus, in some viruses, that's actually capable of shutting down this RNA interference system, which is very interesting. So we're going to have a look as to whether or not rubella can do the same. So how are we going to investigate whether or not rubella is capable of sabotaging this very nice host immune defense system? Here's their experimental setup. So we have kidney cells, hex cells. These are kidney cells, human kidney cells. So we're no longer in the realm of plants. We're in real, actual human cells, although they're uh, cell lines. So they're not exactly, exactly the same cells that you would have in your body, but they're very close. So we're going to put three different pieces of DNA inside these kidney cells. The first piece of DNA that we're going to put in codes for a protein called EGFP. EGFP is a fluorescent protein, uh, so it glows when excited by certain wavelengths of light. That's not important for this paper. It's just a protein, and it's a protein that kidney cells don't usually make. So this is the test. So we're forcing it to make our test protein here. Then we're also going to put in DNA that makes a short hairpin RNA. So short hairpins are our way, our as in scientists way, of mimicking this double-stranded RNA that viruses would normally have. So I had to call it short hairpin because that's what it is in the paper. So if you see SH RNA, just think of it as like fake virus DNA, uh, fake virus RNA, okay? Then we're going to put a third bit of DNA in the cell that makes for the rubella virus capsid, so the outside of the rubella virus. 
And in another experiment, we're going to also put this Sem Leaky Forest Virus code. So this is our positive control. So this virus has been proven to sabotage RNA interference. So I'll recap. We have a test protein that makes this pro- We have a test sequence that makes this protein. We also put in fake viral D- uh, fake, uh, fake viral double-stranded RNA. And we're also putting in the sequence to make the virus code. Okay, so the cell is making all three of these things. Keep that in mind. Let's look at some data now. This is what's called a northern blot. So for those of you who've never taken upper level biology, this is basically a way to detect the presence of RNA. And so the black smudge that you see on the screen there is indicative that RNA has been made, specifically the RNA of our test protein. I'm not going to go into how it works, but, but that's what this says. Test protein fake viral real, right? Uh, so, so, so this is definitely the test protein, then fake viral uh, RNA. Uh, that's like a part of this protein, and then actual DNA that makes the viral capsid. So in this blot, we, uh, good night, Eric. In this blot, this first section basically tells us whether or not we made our test protein successfully. And we did, right? We see the presence of a band, so we know that we did in fact make EGFP mRNA, which is great. Something that's very beautiful about science, or at least when science is done well, is the abundance of controls. So we're also going to be keeping track of whether or not the general RNA making machinery in the cells is still functional. So that's this gap DH mRNA down here. All this is saying is that when we put all this DNA in the cell, that their ability to make RNA is not different. So that's what this lane is. Vector. So, when we put the vector in, this is the vector, the DNA that contains the sequence of fake viral... Uh, like the... the I shouldn't say fake. The mimic of the viral RNA. So this is what the cell would detect and destroy. So, the band is lighter, meaning that there's less of this EGFP mRNA. What does that mean? When we put in the test protein sequence, and we put in the uh, viral RNA that the host uses to mount an immune response, that you get less of that mRNA out. Okay? So, this is really important, and I'll take a minute while I hydrate for chat to ask questions if they don't quite get it. We put in the test sequence, then we also added the bit of RNA that the host needs to destroy uh, the virus. And when we add those two things, it looks like the system is working. We have less EGFP RNA after we gave it the uh, short hairpin. Error checking transcription enzymes were your favorite thing in microbiology. Yeah, DNA repair is its own, like, deep, deep, deep hole to get into. And how DNA gets repaired is so interesting. Um, you really come to appreciate that, again, we are just biological machines. And all it takes is for things to be the correct shape or the wrong shape. And that's all that matters. Um, in, in biology is just you're a bag of soup of jiggling molecules and that bag of soup has figured out how to sustain life it's pretty incredible all right I'm guessing my latency is okay so I'm taking the silence as that we're on the same page here so I'll move on 
when we put in the coat from our positive control virus, we see that band darken again, which means that this virus, who we know can interfere with RNA interference, uh, we do get this regeneration of EGFP mRNA. So yeah, uh, so we know that SFV virus successfully stops RNA interference. Does it stop RNAi in our hands? So this is a control that scientists do just to make sure that everything is working. So, so far, all the controls have been great, right? Uh, everything is working as we expected. This bag of soup also does not appreciate being called a bag of soup. Uh, embrace it. Embrace being a bag of soup. Look at me on the screen. I'm a bag of soup. So it looks like our experiment is going well. Uh, our, their experiment is going well. What about rubella? It looks like rubella is the same as the SFV capsid in the sense that the rubella capsid coat can also stop the EGFP mRNA from being degraded. Uh, and we know that this isn't because of some screw up with the mRNA making machinery because our control mRNA is all good. So that's interesting, but there are still a lot of pressing questions, right? Does this actually matter? Like, sure. It looks like the coat actually can stop this RNA interference from happening. What about the protein? Or, or sorry, that's not what this says. This one basically just says that we successfully made the proteins. Okay, so we know we learned something about rubella. That rubella is also capable of doing this RNA interference thing, which is very cool, very fun. What scientists also like to do is something called a dose response, which basically means, hey, if we add more protein coat, does the effect increase? And just look at this, right? Same controls, EGFP, we get EGFP RNA. That makes sense. We put it in there. When we add the inhibitory RNA, the RNA that is used to destroy the mRNA, we lose that band, perfect. When we add our positive control virus, you repair the ability to, or, or rather you, you prevent RNA interference from happening, so you regenerate that EGFP mRNA. And now as you add more and more capsids, so we go from 1 microgram to 0.5 microgram to 1 microgram of the DNA to make the capsid, you see that more and more of that EGFP mRNA is saved from destruction. So again, the more coat that you make, the more mRNA is protected by the cell's immune system. Pretty cool, right? I think that's pretty neat. So are there any questions here from chat? Because the next slide has to is, is pivoting away from this particular idea. So it scales, neat. Yeah, yeah. That's important because you don't know if you just like fundamentally broke something or whether or not this is actually, you know, dependent on how much of the active agent you put in. Important to know. Okay, so... Uh, if y'all don't have a question, I know I certainly have a question, and that question is... Give me one second to charge my phone so that OBS... Uh, so that uh, YouTube Studio doesn't crap out on me. Oh, come on, come on, come on. We can do this, we can do this. Okay. Uh, I'm hesitantly following, yes. Cool, cool. If you've made it this far, that's already kind of an accomplishment. Wait, DNA works that way? Like, throwing more DNA at the problem fixes it harder? Not always, right? So this... Actually, you know, let me double check before I spread misinformation about this paper. Um... I'm pretty sure the microgram, you know what, maybe I'll do it at the end, or maybe I'll leave it as a comment so I don't, like, uh, break the flow of the stream too bad. But, um, the more, I mean, that's a really good question, actually. I'm definitely gonna have to double check that. I kind of glossed over it, but you're absolutely, the question is good, I should say, and it's definitely worth checking in on. Um, 
whether or not this is one microgram of the capsid or DNA is really, really good to know. Okay. Good catch, good catch. I will have to keep that in mind when I pin a comment at the end of the stream. So my question for the authors at this point of the paper is, okay, you've convinced me that in this very artificial setting that your viral capsid interferes with RNA, with RNA interference or interferes with the host's immune system. My follow-up would be, how, how, how's it doing that? How's it happening? How does the rubella viral coat stop RNA interference from happening? That's the question that I so desperately want to know. And so I think a fun part of my stream is we'll take a crack at it together. Um, so this is what the system looks like, right? We went through this slide earlier. This is how siRNA happens. So virus infects hosts. The host processes this double-stranded RNA with the enzyme Dicer. Dicer makes the siRNA. The siRNA destroys the complex. So this is a question for my fellow bioheads in chat. If you could maybe guide the people that are a little earlier in their education or if the people, or if anybody wants to take a stab, how would you, as an experimental scientist, figure out at what stage does this viral capsid do its job? And uh, if, if you were all my real class, I would just sit in silence until I got an answer, but I won't, I won't make you sit too long with it. The reason why I think it's important to take pauses like this, by the way, is because it's no fun to just hear me talk about the answer. I think it's more fun to, to take a pause and to allow you to imagine your own solution, and that way we can compare notes, which I think is, you know, a part that I appreciated about undergrad. Right. So, one possible way that you can start to figure out where this viral capsid is doing its job is to measure the siRNA. If you suspect that maybe the virus blocks something in this uh, step, uh, then you might be able to further in, like, investigate where this capsid is doing what it needs to do. So if you break something up here, or if you measure something down here, that might be a good strategy. I'd probably test the risk complex remain functional overall. That's a great approach, and it's something that we'll actually get into later in the paper, but for now, they actually have a much more simple explanation. If what is breaking is the siRNA generation, when we add in that capsid, when we add in the ability to make the viral coat, if the siRNA is the thing that's breaking, when we measure the siRNA, it should be lower when we're also making the protein, when we're also making the um, virus coat. Does that kind of make sense? So the authors want to measure the siRNA as they are uh, making the viral capsid. Because that's one possibility. One possibility is that the virus blocks the siRNA from being made. And then that narrows down where that protein coat could be doing its job, right? Because if the virus capsid is blocking this down here at the step where the risk complex is destroying the transcript, then the siRNA level should be the same. So this is a pretty straightforward, not too complicated, quick test that you can do to just get an idea, to narrow down the possibilities. That follows, that tracks, great, great, great. Okay, so let's see what they find. So, down here, these are the RNA size markers. So this is just a little bit of RNA that they've loaded on the northern blot, and uh, it gives us an idea for how big the sizes are, because siRNA is usually about this big, uh, and this is where these bands appear on this gel. We have down here our loading control, again, just to make sure that A, the RNA machinery is working just fine in all the cells, and to make sure that about the same amount of 
organic material is loaded in each of these wells. So these are just set up the controls, right? So we take a look at our first lane. If we only put in the test protein, then we get no RNA, siRNA, right? We get no interfering RNA. That makes sense. We didn't put any RNA in there, uh, siRNA in there. So it makes sense that we don't see siRNA. So that checks out. When we put in the vector that controls, that has the sequence for the SH vector, ugh, words. When we put in the vector that contains the sequence that creates this fake viral double-stranded RNA, then we see the siRNA being generated. Beautiful positive control, right? We make the siRNA because we've detected this fake viral RNA. So we know our system is functioning well. What about our uh, controls? So the virus that we know inhibits viral uh, RNA interference. When you add that capsid, you get a reduction of siRNA. So it looks like for this particular virus that we know more information about, that this does in fact work at the level of reducing the amount of siRNA, uh, which is good to know. Lots of controls in this, which makes sense. Yeah. Uh, you know, when I first started learning biology, it was annoying, but now that I'm like deep into biology, it's really satisfying because you get to see exactly how an argument comes together. Rubella appears to work in the same fashion as this SFV virus. So both Rubella and SFV both appear to prevent the production of siRNA. So it appears that, uh, you know, if you've watched JoJo, like, they're the same type stand, right? So they act in a similar fashion, which is very exciting because now we've learned that if we go back here, we've learned that we've kind of narrowed down where the viral capsid is doing its job. So it's not doing its job down here. It's doing its job somewhere up here, maybe. I mean, it could even be doing it up here. Who knows? But we've eliminated one possibility, and that's what science is about. It's about eliminating possibilities. We also know, in terms of probing exactly what the thing is doing, that the rubella coat can bind double-stranded RNA. So down here, we see uh, double-stranded RNA being loaded, so that's where this is. This is maltose binding protein, which is a negative control. This gets a little hairy into biochemistry, but basically, sometimes when you need to purify protein, you'll add the DNA sequence for a convenient protein that's like a, a handle, and maltose binding protein is a convenient handle. So the researchers made the viral coat, the actual protein sequence, attached a maltose binding protein so that they could purify it. So now we have to make it a control. So we know that the maltose binding protein does not bind double-stranded RNA because in this particular assay called the uh, EMSA, if we get binding of RNA, we'll see a shift from this position to up here. This must be the work of an RNA stand. Oh, more juice. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Here's the thing about me and Jojo, or rather Jojo in biology. There's a plan to make a video about the time that Araki designed the cover of Cell? Google this, Google this. Araki Cell Journal. Araki designed the cover of an issue of one of the most prestigious biology journals in history, and it's awesome. Um, truly, truly amazing. Hello. Tumble dry shoes. No, I'm not kidding. Araki absolutely dis created that cover. Um, and it's it slaps. Uh, so the JoJo, so the RNA stand thing, I mean, the, I can't even say that that's my own idea, right? Araki had it before me, because of course, Araki's a genius. Okay. Uh, Rubella coat can bind double stranded RNA. Uh, maltose binding protein does it because it's still down here. DSRNA is fine.
What about our purified protein? The maltose binding protein attached to the viral coat does bind double-stranded RNA. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm watching the reaction in chat. Yeah, dude, biology is so cool, man. There's so much, like, in terms of the percentage of biology that I want to share with you all, I've shared maybe like half a percent of insane biology things from all my years of biology study. But the fact that Araki did, like, do that, that's worthy of its own long form video. I want to go so hard on that video, like, ah, uh, it's incredible. I think, to me, biology is in the perfect spot for imagination, and that's why I'm so passionate about teaching it, because chemistry, and not to offend any chemistry heads here, right? But like chemistry, I think benefits from demonstration. Like it benefits from you being able to see chemistry. But I think biology leans more into your imagination because you can't really see it without like a high powered microscope, right? So I think that's why you get all sorts of creative things like cells at work, Araki designing the cover of cell, a lot of anthropomorphization because at every level of biology, you get stories. Right? There's obviously the story of the evolution of human beings. There are individual stories for how individual organisms have come to be, but you keep on amplifying or magnifying that microscope and you get more and more interesting and more and more interesting stories with more and more interesting players and characters to the point where even an enzyme, like the cover of Araki's cell journal suggests, even an enzyme can be a character. And that's why I think biology is so, 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 so cool. All your videos so far have been amazing. The little extra like the cell cover just adds to the magic. Please keep it up. Thank you so much. It's basically my life uh, goal is to pill as many people into loving biology. I don't know how many of you all convinced to do biology. That's okay. Not everybody has to do biology. But if everybody has a healthy respect and appreciation for biology, that would be that would be the best. You know, um, yeah, that'd be so cool. Uh, anyway, back to the paper. So, the EMSA tells you whether or not two things have bound uh, by a shift in the gel. So it's a shift in the mobility of things. So if you are a larger molecule, you will get stuck as the gel tries to push you through an electric current. So molecules start up here, then an electric current is run through them, and they migrate through the gel. So if you're smaller, you're not going to have a hard time running through the gel at all, so you'll end up down here. If you're big and bulky because you're bound to something, then you get stuck in the gel and your band shifts up. So it looks like the more capsid, the more viral capsid you put in to bind to RNA, the more it gets bound. So that suggests that the rubella coat might be hiding the double-stranded RNA. So if you look back here, virus infects hosts, the host processes viral double-stranded RNA with Dicer. That finding suggests that the viral coat is preventing Dicer from converting the double-stranded RNA into single-stranded RNA, maybe because the viral coat is just hiding that RNA away from Dicer. It's possible. Biology needs cool explosions to compete with chemistry and physics in the classroom. But chemistry and physics have nothing on cells at work. Uh, if you can make an anime about it, um, I think biology ultimately wins. At least that's my opinion. Uh, where were we? Sneaky, sneaky, rubella, very sus. True, 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 true. Okay, so I believe there's one more graph here. But I'll, I'll do a quick recap, right? So, RNA interference, uh, for those of you who may have joined later on in the stream, is a way for the cell to regulate its own mRNA, its own messenger RNA, the stuff that eventually gets made into protein. We think that this system might be useful in fighting off viral infections because viral viruses can be double-stranded RNA viruses as well. So when cells encounter this double-stranded RNA, it can then convert that RNA into an siRNA which destroys its 
like twin, basically, preventing the virus from making copies of its own protein. What we've learned so far from the protein, uh, from the paper, is that rubella is capable of preventing this RNA interference system from happening, potentially by hiding its own double-stranded RNA away from the cell. It's a lot harder to make cute things for inorganic molecules and whatever physics adds. It's true. That's why, like, as a big anime person, I mean, you can tell I'm a VTuber. As, like, a, as an anime person, uh, I sure like it when my stuff is cute. Definitely helps with the appeal. We have one more uh, figure to go through. And this one's a really meaty one. This one's going to be tough to work through, but we're going to go through it together. So, so... Uh, if you're just using me for background noise, there's no reason to tune back in. But if you want to see, you know, what I find to be beautiful about this, we're going to have to turn our thinking caps on. Didn't someone make a pretty cute anime about the immune system? That would be Cells at Work, and I love it dearly. I revealed this bit of lore on Cideray's Twitch channel, but I actually was working on my own YouTube series with my partner Toxo that was going to be like that. But then I got scooped by Cells at Work, and then we kind of gave up on the project because it was too hard. But we took those assets and, like, I maybe I'll release them for, like, a membership reward one day, but you can see that, like, you know, people don't really talk about their failures, but that was a lot of time and investment for a project we completely threw away. But then we took that project and now it's uh, Phi the Neutrophil, and I think that's awesome. Okay, so this figure is going to be a bit meaty, so, so hang on to your horses. All of this is cool, but we don't actually know if the rubella coat can do this in an actual cell that matters in a way that matters. So it has this like neat RNA interference thing, but does it matter? Does it stop a virus from existing? That's ultimately what's important here. And while this experiment is maybe not the one that I like the most, this is this author's or this group's attempt at showing that this is biologically relevant. So just because the rubella coat can hide, quote unquote, hide this double-stranded RNA away from the dicer. Doesn't actually mean that this is relevant in any kind of way. So what did the authors do to uh, suggest otherwise? Well, they infected some of these kidney cells, these HEC2, uh, HEC293 T cells. They infected these kidney cells with a different virus that needs RNA interference to work. And then they broke that virus, and then they tried to see whether or not the rubella coat could save it. So again, this SFV virus, it needs viral interference to replicate properly. If you break its ability to do RNA interference, does adding the rubella protein coat save its functionality? So that's a very meaty, very tough concept to get across. And please ask me questions, or if you want me to repeat myself, I'm very happy to do so. But that's essentially their strategy. So we're going to walk through this together, okay? Down here, these arrows. This bar is our control. So it's a control to just see what happens when you put in the fully functional SFV virus into the cell. And we have... 12 hours post-infection and 24 hours post-infection, you see that when you add the virus, you go from a little bit of viral RNA to a ton of viral RNA, down from like one unit to 80-fold increase in these kidney cells. So this is representative of a successful infection. Okay? Successful infection by a uh, non-mutated virus. Next slide. When you break the SFV virus with these mutations, when you break its ability to do RNA interference, you see that its viral accumulation after 24 hours is much, much, much lower. So it's about half of what it would normally be. Pretty big difference. So all that's saying is that our system appears to be working all right. Then this next one, we 
break the virus, but then we put in the functioning SFV capsid. So this is all positive control. So if you break the virus, but then add the fixed version of the protein capsid, uh, the, the viral capsid, you get RNA interference again, and then you get an increase of viral RNA accumulation. So you've saved the virus's ability by reintroducing the part that was broken. Classic molecular biology, right? Breaking things and fixing them one at a time is how we discover how things function. And this is a great example of how to do that. But that's all control, right? That's all in a system that we're aware of. What about rubella? Does rubella share the same capability? We'll take a look. This next bar. Uh, oh, sorry. There's another control. So this is the broken virus with a broken capsid. So if you break the capsid and you add it, it doesn't help. That's obvious, right? Broken virus, broken capsid, doesn't fix it. Okay. All of that makes sense. And we have to do all of them to make sure that the controls are solid and they appear to be pretty good so far. Now we'll get into what happens when we try to fix the SFV virus with the rubella virus. Okay, so this first one is broken SFV virus and regular rubella capsid, and it saves it, right? So it's not like fully back up top here, but we do see that this is high, right? That this is higher. Uh, we're making this comparison here. This is higher than the broken version of the SFV virus. So adding the capsid for the rubella virus saves its ability to replicate, at least to some extent. When you break the rubella capsid, you still see that loss like you did in the SFV. So it appears to not be a fluke, right? If you break it in the same way that you broke the SFV capsid, this definitely points to the fact that this capsid needs to be intact for it to repair or, or to block RNA interference. I bet the scientists felt the same way I do whenever I see a build that has compiled successfully at work. True, 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 true. I'm guessing that compiling takes a long time and so do these experiments. Although, uh, my understanding is that these experiments are probably, probably take longer than compiling, but I, I don't know that for a fact. Joshua, it took, it worked, but not completely. Yeah, there's, there, I don't really know why the authors didn't draw bars over this control. Um, so I'm not, I don't really know if these differences are statistically significant. It's a good question though. But yeah, it looks like adding the capsid of rubella to this broken virus repairs its ability to fight the host immune system. And these last two are basically like somewhat similar uh, in the sense that like, uh, this one to the right of it, which I'm not covering, deleted a whole chunk of the capsid. It's still broken. And then this one up here is with no dice, so no dice. So I didn't cover every figure in the paper. I should have mentioned that at the start, actually. I mentioned it in the comments. But, you know, to keep the pace of the stream, there are experiments that I left out. No dice is one of them, where they actually did this in uh, cells that had no dicer. So it looks like this is another type of control, right? So if you break the virus uh, and um, you don't have functioning dicer, you still get uh, uh, a bit of that inhibition going on. Um, although I haven't really thought about the implication of this last bar too much. If my build took as long as some experiments, I would ask for more money at my job. <laughs> that's fair, that's fair. So this paper, right? We were mostly reading for pleasure, but I do have two complaints, and we've reached the end of my coverage of it. Again, there are more figures in the paper you can look at, but here's the end of where I would like draw the line. But I do want to talk about my ending thoughts. This paper was published in a journal that wasn't, you know, it's pretty good. It's in uh, MDPI, their, their viruses journal. Not bad, pretty high H factor, uh, not a bad impact score. So it's safe to say that I trust these scientists. But I do have some complaints. 
up until the end, the data weren't quantitative. We saw a lot of blots, but they didn't actually have bar graphs, which was kind of sad, right? So down here we have blots, which, uh, bar graphs, which is great, but like, up here, you know, like these, uh, northern blots can definitely be quanti quantified. Uh, so I'm a little sad to see that they didn't actually make these into bar graphs. Yeah, so H factor, I don't 100% understand exactly how the H factor is calculated. But it's basically a metric by which we can judge the quality of journals. So this this comes from a journal with a name. Uh, so it's more likely to be legit, I'll say. The second question I have is with this experiment. So I think it's very cool that the broken SFV virus can be fixed by adding the rubella capsid. But... What about the rubella virus, right? <laughs> it's cool that the rubella coat can fix or can inhibit RNA interference. It's cool that that can happen. Whether or not the rubella virus itself cares, we don't actually know that from this paper. And I really wonder why the authors couldn't do that experiment. Maybe they have a good reason. And if it's in the discussion section, I'll pin it in the comments after the stream. But to me, you know, it's, it's cool, but I don't know if that really matters for the rubella virus, like, in general. Does that make sense? And with that, I've kind of reached, like, the end of my coverage of this paper. I want to know what your thoughts are, in general, about this paper, about RNA, about RNA interference. I'd like to know if you were able to follow along. If I've done a good enough job, because this idea of mine to do journal club for non-scientists or potentially non-scientists, I think most people would find that crazy. But I think that it's worth trying because so often the actual nuts and bolts of what scientists read go unexplored by most people. And I think... Not only is it good in, like, you know, brain practice to try and, like, work through a paper, but I also think that it shows the beauty of an argument, like, all of these controls to rule out alternate possibilities. Like, oh, if the mRNA is decreased because the cells just weren't happy, that could be a confounding factor. But we know that the cells were happy, or at least happy enough because we did the appropriate controls, that, like, rigorous system of experimentation is what I think makes biology so beautiful. So we've kind of entered the post-paper chatting session. Let me, let me transform into Big Five for a sec. It's me. It's Big Oh, my feet have been cut off. It's okay. Don't need to see that anyway. Yeah, so what do we think about this journal club experience? So curious to know. It felt good to be able to at least somewhat understand an actual paper. Thank you. Uh, Joshua, you said you were in high school, is that correct? I'm wondering at what level you're at in terms of, uh, what you, you know, where you're at in your biology journey, I could say. I'm going to have a drink of my tea. Just finished high school. Cool, cool. Are you thinking about biology in a, like a professional capacity or are you here to, to vibe? Uh, to vibe along with learning biology. Didn't end up following along that much? No worries, no worries. Happy to have the watch hours uh, if I'm on the in the background. It's also a very acceptable outcome. Yeah, uh, right now, for at least the US, uh, universities are just starting back up. So unfortunately, these like oddball middle of the day uh, 
streams are going to come to an end soon uh, as my actual job begins, but I kind of like doing these, especially with my uh, uh, schedule. Mostly for the vibe, we've got a good job in a family company. I actually think that's really cool. I think that's cool that people who don't have a professional interest in biology come hang out and uh, check out what I have to say. That's, that's awesome. Alright. So is there anything else that the couple of you watching would like to know in general about biology before I sign off, right? Got a little bit of time to kill, so if we want to revisit some burning questions, we can call this segment of the stream, like office hours, uh, any entertaining hypotheticals that you want to toss out or have any suggestions for fictional biology that I might want to have a look at. Because I'm still gathering stuff for like my shorts, right? Like, I'm kind of happy uh, to finish the Plague Inc. series, but at the same time, there's a part of me that worries that like, Oh, you know, once I finish the Plague Inc. series, is anyone going to watch my shorts? Because uh, apparently the Pokemon shorts don't do as well as the Plague Inc. shorts, which I think is interesting because I thought that the audience for Plague Inc. would have been a lot smaller than the audience for Pokemon. But maybe it's because people who enjoy Pokemon don't necessarily enjoy biology at a, at a higher than normal rate, which I guess that makes sense. Pokemon is pretty pretty accessible. I really like the attempt at introducing papers to more casual readers. They are often so scary and shouldn't necessarily be so. I agree. Unfortunately, um, you need a lot of biology background to be able to penetrate these papers. But once you have someone like explain to you, oh, this is what this is, this is what that is, at the core of it, anybody can understand a scientific paper, right? Because if you were able to follow along, it's not that hard to get the gist of the papers. It does require intense reading, but that's why I say that like academics are not necessarily smarter than everybody else. It's just that we're more obsessed and have more time to professionally learn how to do it. Um, but it doesn't require like 5,000 IQ to read a paper. It just requires learning all the terminology and, and background. And there's a lot of specialist terminology and it's a very dense. Yeah, it's not easy. That part is like, I would describe it as like uh, brushing your teeth, right? Or working out. It's just, it's stuff that you have to do to be able to get to the juicy stuff. But the juicy stuff is fun and more like mentally engaging. But you can't actually get there until you learn what everything is, right? My professor in grad school, a professor that I TA'd for, used to say like, it's such a shame that we have to teach all of this background stuff, but you can't actually get to the fun stuff until you all know what a mitochondria is. <laughs> and I think that stops biology from being as accessible as, you know, watching somebody blow something up on screen or doing math. Because even though math is hard, all you need is a, you know, if, if you get the math, then it's, it's not that inaccessible to you. The biology has a weakness in that you can't actually see it happen and you just kind of have to you just kind of have to take our word that it happens uh, unless you're in a lab and you can see it for yourself what's up with cryopreservation it's in a lot of fiction but i don't know how viable it is or will be so the thing about cryopreservation is that it does happen in fact we cryopreserve all the time it just Depends on which organisms survive cryopreservation, right? Bacteria, E. coli, yeast, they survive cryopreservation very well. If you freeze them fast enough and you include uh, anti-like crystal forming agents in, in their liquid media. Because what kills in the sense of cryopreservation is ice crystal formation. So the formation of ice crystals inside a liquid bag you can imagine it'd be very bad for crystals to form because you start puncturing things. And when you start puncturing things in biology, you start breaking things. When you start breaking things, the organisms, organisms generally can't survive being sheared from the inside out. 
because ice also expands while it freezes. So if you're a tight uh, water bag and you freeze, all of a sudden there's more volume in you than your membranes can take and you end up shearing, right? No good. So cryopreservation does work, asterisk, but if you're like a bacteria or a yeast with a very hardy cell wall, then you might be able to better survive it. And again, only if you're frozen very quickly before the formation of ice crystals. I hope that answers your question. My brain is screaming at me, the powerhouse of the cell, true. Honestly, honestly true. Uh, powerhouse of the cell indeed. And I would love to talk about mitochondria in a long video. Like, again, I had mentioned my philosophy for streams. Streams should be like lower effort and reserved to these like journal clubs where I can just learn along with you. But to explain the complicated story of the mitochondria in a way that is cool and inspiring, I think it requires my full time attention, full time creative attention. Whereas here, I'm just kind of BSing. If the physicist could invent a way to freeze liquid without forming ice crystals. Yeah, yeah. If you do it fast enough, you can definitely get away with the formation without the formation of ice crystals. But the thing is, is that if you think about your body, right? Your body is at 97-ish degrees Fahrenheit, whatever, thir 38 or whatever Celsius. Your body is pretty warm. Your body's pretty warm, and water has a very high specific heat, so it resists changes in temperature. So even if you were dunked in a vat of liquid nitrogen, it would still take a good amount of time for you to freeze, and in that time, you're gonna form ice crystals, you're gonna shear your cells, you'll die. You're like... I don't, I don't know if that problem will ever be solved for something larger than a microorganism. It's pretty interesting, though. Although... If you haven't watched my uh, tardigrade video, I do talk about freezing, and tardigrades are an animal, so a eukaryote, so not a yeast or bacteria, uh, that can survive being frozen through a very, very fun trick that uh, tardigrade proteins evolved to pull off, which is very fun. My first experience with mitochondria was the game Parasite Eve. Maybe that's a good candidate for me to do a short on in the future, although I've never played it. So it's not necessary to know exactly how proteins look to understand how it interferes with cells' chemistry. Yes! That's a great way of putting it. And that's, again, why I think my job, like, why being a scientist is so awesome is because you get to learn so much about how clever these scientists are that they don't actually have to see anything to be able to make valid conclusions about their system. Just in this paper, right? We didn't actually visualize the protein, but we broke it. We know we broke it. We know we broke it because we put in different DNA when we wanted to break it. And when we broke it, it had an effect, so we know that it did something. Preventing the formation of ice crystals is actually a very interesting topic within biology. You can read about antifreeze proteins if you're curious. Very interesting. Yeah, I thought about doing extremophiles as a video idea, and I ended up doing the tardigrade, honestly because I thought more people will click on it. <laughs> uh, biology nerds love tardigrades, but, you know, a rando archaea in a, in a geothermal vent. It's not as clickable as a tardigrade. So one day, maybe I'll have a look at antifreeze proteins. Saw you on the VTuber subreddit. Refresh the content. Thank you so much, Noboru. Unfortunately, you've caught me right at the end of my stream, but we're kind of vibing about biology. So feel free to, you know, grab a cup of tea. I've got quite a bit of time to just vamp about biology and how much I love it and how awesome it is. Just find an Archaea with a memeable name. Yeah, I know that there are a couple out there with funny names. But the thing is, is that Archaea are actually really interesting. So here's the thing. Promise me, chat, right? Promise me you don't leak this idea to any other biology content creators. Because this idea... This idea, like... This idea slaps. So don't, don't, like, tell, uh... Oh, what are they called? I wanted to work for them, but then they rejected my application. Don't tell SciShow. I applied to have a job at SciShow. They turned me down, unfortunately. 
Uh, and then I started VTubing, so... So don't tell SciShow. Don't tell Krikazat. Don't tell any content creator that does bio biology, but here's something that's going to mess with your brain for at least the next couple of minutes. You ready? You ready, chat? There are no Archaean pathogens. Let me repeat that. There are no Archaea that cause disease. What? What the heck? Think about that. We know that RNA can cause diseases. We know that DNA can cause diseases. We know that proteins can cause disease. We know that prions can cause disease. We know that fungi can cause disease. We know that bacteria and yeast can cause disease. We know that amoeba can cause disease. Uh... We know that ticks can cause disease. There are so many things out there that can cause disease. But Archaea, one of the most ancient branches of living life, don't cause disease that we know of. Take that in for a second. Are all Archaea extremophiles, or is it just a subset of them? I believe it's just a subset. You have natural Archaea amongst your microbiome as well. Although they don't get talked to a lot about. It's kind of interesting. So the question is why, when the entirety of like life form, like every living extant group of living thing has potential to hurt you, like poison ivy can hurt you. Deadly mushrooms can poison you. You can get a fungal infection. You can get mauled by a bear. All of that life has a way to hurt you, but Archaea don't. That's not to say that Archaea can't be harmful when they are left to grow unchecked, but they usually need another infection to piggyback off of, so they don't really, on their own, cause disease in humans, at least. Isn't that wild? That's freaking bonkers. Archaea is so strong that it can survive in near boiling water but can't live inside us? Well, if you think about it, if boiling water is their room temperature, then inside us is freezing. Reject violence become Archaea true. I can't get over the fact that there are no Archaean pathogens and people don't really know why. Like, what the heck? You could be infected by so many bacteria, so many viruses and fungi. But like... Oh, and, and worms. But Archaea? Nah. Archaea are chill. And we have no idea why. And it'd be so interesting to investigate why that might be. Isn't that nuts? That's kind of nuts. I love that. I love that fact. Don't tell Kirkazad. Don't tell SciShow. That's just for us here, on this stream. Um, give me one second, I just got a message. Feel free to ask more questions about biology, by the way. Might have to cut the stream short. Give me a second. Do you have to drop for now for an actual work meeting? But thanks for the knowledge. No problem. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. Where was I before? I think I wanted to say other things. It's like Archaea. Um, could you try freezing a very recently dead body and then try resuscitate after you're done freezing? Uh, run into the same issues. Bodies are too hot. It would probably take too long to cool down all that water in your body. How are people not obsessed with Archaea with a monolayer cell membrane? Ah, uh, that's interesting. I'm actually, I don't actually know too much about 
uh, how arcade work, and that's why like being able to do an arcade video would give me the excuse to really dig deep into how arcade work. Oh, if you have any suggestions for a particular arcade I should look at, I'm all ears. Alright, so, I think that was a pretty fun stream. Uh, I hope you all learned to appreciate RNA. I do say I will have to go now, but I really enjoyed getting to chat with you all and getting to share a little bit about how RNA works. I hope you all have a good rest of your day, and hopefully I'll see you in the next one. Uh, again, one more teaser. I have things in the works, collab coming up, more information to be revealed in the coming week, so please keep an eye out for that. With that, I will say Goodbye to you all. Goodbye. Let's do... Let's do... Oh. Let's do this one. Oh, not mad. Oh, God. Let's do this one. Bye-bye.